as we begin our time of worship, hear these words from the psalm for today. Where God dwells, steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Beginning at the first page on our service picture. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. We pray our prayer of preparation together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our loving God holds all people as precious. We ask for forgiveness for those times when we see ourselves or others as beyond the reach of God's redeeming love. So let us in silence admit our frailty and confess our failings. When we turn to God in our hearts, God speaks peace to the faithful, and his shalom makes us whole. Let us make our confession together in the second prayer in your service booklet. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive you, and free you from your sin. Heal and strengthen you by his spirit and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us take some moments in silent prayer as we prepare to hear God's living word to us this day. gather our prayers together in the words of the Collect for this day. Holy God, you speak to us in a voice unexpected and come to us in ways we do not recognise, never leaving us to our own devices or defences. You are the ever-present, all-powerful God. Call us out in faith again and again until we learn to walk with you in steadfast love and faithfulness, and in peace. In the name of him who comes to us upon the waters, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I'd like to invite Sue to come and read our reading from our Psalm 85. Psalm 85, verses 8 to 13. I am listening to what the Lord God is saying. He promises peace to us, his own people, if we do not go back to our foolish ways. Surely he is ready to save those who honour him, and his saving presence will remain in our land. Love and righteousness will meet, righteousness and peace will embrace. Human loyalty will reach up from the earth. God's righteousness will look down from heaven. The Lord will make us prosperous, and our land will produce rich harvests. Righteousness will go before the Lord and prepare the path for him. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thank you be to God. Please, would you stand for the gospel? Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Right then, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side of the lake while he dismissed the crowds. When he sent them away, he went up onto a mountain by himself to pray. Evening came and he was alone. Meanwhile, the boat, fighting a strong headwind, was being battered by the waves and was already far away from land. Very early in the morning, he came to his disciples, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost! They were so frightened, they screamed. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them. Be encouraged, it's me. Don't be afraid. Peter replied, Lord, if it's you, order me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Then Peter got out of the boat and was walking on the water towards Jesus. But when Peter saw the strong wind, he became frightened. As he began to sink, he shouted, Lord, rescue me. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him, saying, you man of weak faith, why did you begin to have doubts? When they got into the boat, the wind settled down. Then those in the boat worshipped Jesus and said, You must be God's son. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Loving God, may these spoken words be faithful to the written word and lead us to the living word, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Living in these times means that many of us are becoming more familiar with what it means to live with or in fear. Maybe it's your own fear. Fear for those you love and care for, or simply as a witness to the fear of those you know, or the fear on the faces of those projected on your television screens. Fear in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's not something we can control at will. It's a primal, necessary response. It's what galvanised us into action as Stone Age women and men fleeing from hairy, rampaging mammoths across the land. It's what keeps us wisely cautious in these days as we heed government advice and take appropriate action to protect those we love, ourselves, and the communities in which we live. Yet so often as a faith community, we're a bit ambivalent about fear. We're not quite sure what to do with it. So it's perhaps timely that in these times, we're invited to reflect upon this story from the Gospels, which places a spotlight on fear. A story that, I don't know, maybe you like me have heard many sermons like this, that rest from this story, this meaning, that being fearful is a clear sign that you lack faith. Really? Is that the only way to read this story? 
Let's rewind and remind ourselves of the events that we've just heard. This encounter takes place on the Sea of Galilee. Now the Sea of Galilee is a body of water and it's surrounded by hills and mountains and it's prone to sudden violent storms. It's an unpredictable place. Not only that, but this encounter takes place at night. The disciples are in a boat crossing the sea on their own and as the night wears on, the wind and the waves intensify and the disciples, still far from land, struggle against the turbulent water. And Jesus is nowhere to be seen. He's not snoozing in the boat, not on this occasion. They're on their own. And as the disciples battle against the elements, some time before dawn, Jesus descends from the hills where he spent the night in prayer and he approaches the boat. And when the disciples see him walking across the water, they're terrified. It's a ghost, they cry. Immediately, Matthew's gospel stresses that word. Jesus identifies himself in an effort to reassure his friends. Take courage, it's I. Don't be afraid. Now, as far as we know, 11 of the disciples, frozen in fear, say nothing. But then we have Peter. Brash, impetuous, over-the-top Peter, who proposes a bizarre test to prove this would-be ghost's identity. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus with a certain amount of resignation in his voice, says, okay then, Peter, come. And Peter steps boldly, recklessly, out of the boat. <coughs> In a few seconds, Peter's walking on the water, and then he realises what he's doing, as is always the case with Peter. His brain catches up behind his body. He notices the vicious wind, the rising waves, the dark water, and fear overwhelms him and he begins to drown. Lord, save me, he cries. Immediately, Jesus reaches out his hand, catches Peter, and delivers him to safety. You of little faith, Jesus says to the breathless, sopping Peter, once the worst of the danger is over. Why did you doubt? We never hear Peter's answer, probably just as well. But as soon as he and Jesus climb back into the boat, the wind dies down, the sea grows still and calm, and the disciples have their eyes open, and they see Jesus for who he is, the Son of God. I've heard interpretations of this story that suggest that Jesus was calling Peter to test his faith. I don't know about you, but I've poured through the Gospels and I have yet to find anywhere in the Gospels where we are called to prove our faith or test God's character by taking pointless risks that threaten our lives and the lives of those around us. Whether we're talking about respecting the power of the sea during a vicious storm or heeding expert medical advice during a global pandemic, the same caution applies. Recklessness is not faith. Stupidity isn't courage. Notice carefully the events of Matthew's Gospel as he relates them. When the disciples see Jesus walking on the water, they're terrified. They don't recognise him. They think they're seeing a ghost. And naturally they cry out in fear. And at that instant, immediately, Jesus offers them comfort and reassurance. Take heart, it's me. 
What's at play here is not the morality or immorality of human fear, but of how we are responding to God's presence when we're afraid. The disciples aren't wrong to be afraid. They're afraid because they're not that keen on drowning. They're afraid because gigantic waves in the middle of the night are scary. They're afraid because they lack the tools with which to process what they're seeing. Human beings don't have the ability to walk on water. Hence, it must be a ghost. If we extend the meaning of drowning to include all the ways in which we as humans find ourselves in and over our heads in this world, then of course we experience fear. Of course we feel afraid as we face COVID-19. Failing economies, social isolation, political brokenness. Of course we feel afraid when unhealthy marriages, sick children, unfriendly neighbours, grinding jobs and financial uncertainty threaten our well-being. Of course, we feel afraid when our basic biology betrays us into anxiety, panic, and depression. The issue isn't fear. It's where the fear leads us. And notice that the first place that Peter's fear leads him is straight to suspicion and distrust. His fear leads him to test and question Jesus' identity instead of taking Jesus' self-disclosure at face value. If it's you, Lord, enable me to do the impossible. If it's you, make magic happen so that I'll be dazzled out of all of my doubt. If it's you, reorder reality and prove to me that you're God. Don't know about you. I recognise myself in Peter's response here. Because when I face fearsome circumstances, my go-to position is not trust. It's suspicion. In my fear, I forget that my relationship with God is multifaceted and complex. And I reduce it to something grossly transactional. Okay, Jesus. Prove that you care about me. I'll do A, but you'd better do B in return. Ever had that kind of conversation in your prayer times? Interestingly, Peter's faith test fails. Despite his initial boldness, he's not able to prove who Jesus is by walking on the water. He fails within seconds. Why? Because Jesus doesn't calm the sea for Peter's convenience. Even though Peter steps out of the boat, his circumstances remain wild and turbulent and dangerous. And if Peter thinks that he can manipulate Jesus into making faith easy, he learns otherwise very, very fast. In my mind, the power of this story doesn't lie in Peter's faith. It doesn't lie in Peter's doubt or courage or fear. Peter's trajectory, fascinating though it is, isn't the point of this story. Jesus' trajectory is the point. Because unlike Peter's, it never wavers. It is constant, it is focused, it's relentless and it's unidirectional. From the very beginning of the story, Jesus moves towards his disciples. He moves towards them when they're struggling in the sea. He moves towards them when they decide he's a menacing ghost. He moves towards them when they're terrified by his approach. He moves towards them when they're reckless enough to set him a death. He moves towards them when they begin to drown. He moves towards them 
when they ask for help. In other words, Jesus never stops moving towards us. He never stops moving towards those he loves. He never stops crossing dark water to come to where we are. Neither our fearfulness or our faithfulness or our faithlessness will alter his approach. We're the ones he is heading for. Our flailing bodies are the ones that he pulls up out of the water time and time again. Ours is the boat he climbs into. My prayer is that as we face all the fear that will come to us in the days ahead, in the midst of those storms, we'll hear his voice. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. For I am with you. Amen. So let us stand and affirm our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father of the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered for much of life, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, Place in 
into your loving keeping all those who suffer or have died, knowing their dependence on you and your limitless mercy. We thank you for them and their gifts to the world. We pray for Alan Mason, recently deceased, and all those who mourn him, especially Amy, his wife, and all their family. We ask that we may, in our turn, come to you across the waters of death and live in your company forever. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Faithful God, whose promises stand sure forever, we thank you for caring for us and for your refusal to give up on us. Merciful Father, I accept these prayers for the sake of your Son. Please, would you stand for the peace? Peace is the gift that Jesus brings to his disciples in the storms of life and in their hearts by faith. And it is a gift that is given to you. It is given to you so that you can share it with the world. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. So like we did last week, if you would like to sign the peace, this is the BSL sign for the peace. Yet at the end they turned on him. 
on the night he was betrayed, he came to table with his friends to celebrate the freedom of your people. This is his story. This is our song. Jesus blessed you, Father, for the food. He took bread. James Dance broke it and said, This is my body, given for you all. Jesus then gave thanks for the wine. He took the cup, gave it and said, This is my blood, shed for you all, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. This is our spot story. This is our song. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate the cross on which he died to set us free. Defying death, he rose again and is alive with you to plead for us and all the world. This is our story. This, this is, is our song. We are in the house. Send your spirit on us now, that by these gifts we may feed on Christ with open eyes and hearts on fire. May we and all who share this food offer ourselves to the living food and be welcomed at your feast in heaven, where all creation worships you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessing and honour and glory of our be yours Through the words we speak, the prayers we breathe, 
for the lives we live. Amen. Amen. We pray our prayer of communion. Almighty God, we look at the Lord Jesus with the body and the blood of your Son Jesus Christ to remain the body of our souls and bodies to be in the sacraments. Send us out from the power of your Spirit Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.